Welcome to Atmos 5000, Day 17. We're focusing in on Chapter 6, Section 6.4 through 6.8. Specifically, we'll be looking at uh, my more detailed cloud classification, including genre, species, and varieties. We'll introduce the concept of the celestial dome and sky coverage. We'll talk a little bit about cloud sizes, and then we'll focus in on the cloud formation mechanisms that lead to fog. So we saw this before from yesterday's uh, previous lecture, and these are the 10 cloud genre, which are the highest level descriptor of the clouds. And then mm -hmm. within each of these genre, we can get more specific about the characteristics of the clouds. So for example, we have a cloud genre, and then we have cloud species. And this table 6.3 shows the World Meteorological Organization cloud species uh, in alphabetical order. Um, <clears throat> and you can read through what each one of these actually uh, corresponds to, but I'll give you some examples. So on the right, uh, we have a cumulus cloud, but specifically, it's a cumulus humulus cloud. And if you look at humulus, uh, over on the left, it just refers to a small vertical extent. So these are clouds that uh, don't have much vertical growth to them, but still fall into the uh, cumulus variety. Uh, excuse me, the cumulus species. Uh, cumulus, cumulus species. Uh, the cumulus mediocris is down below. And if you look on the left, you'll see that mediocris is medium in size. And so these clouds do have some vertical extent to them. Here we have an example of a cumulus congestus cloud. And if you look at the left, a congestus cloud is a very deep cumulus cloud filling most of the troposphere, but still having a crisp cauliflower-like top. And what that actually means is that there's no ice in the very top of this cloud yet. If the cloud had ice, it would have a diffuse fuzzy appearance uh, as opposed to the very distinct cloud edges. Uh, these cumulus congestus are often referred to as towering cumulus clouds as well. Uh, down below, we have an example of a cumulus castellanus. And Castellanus is small turrets that look like a, uh, a part of a castle. Uh, and the uh, turret height is much bigger than the uh, diameter. And you can go through, and there are lots of websites out there that have example pictures of each one of these types of species. Um, in honesty, though, most of the meteorologists that I know uh, are very good at identifying the cloud genre and only about half of them even know where to start when it comes to identifying cloud species. So in addition to cloud genre and cloud species, we can also add in a variety. Uh, in this case, we have an alto cumulus undulatus cloud. Uh, undulatus is a specific cloud variety that shows waves or undulations, and you can see that uh, waves in the cloud uh, on the top right. Uh, the wind is going perpendicular to the cloud streets in this example. Where the air is rising, you'll end up with a cloud layer, and then where the air is descending, you'll end up with clear air in between. And then down below at the bottom right, we have an example of cirrus uh, vertebratus, where it kind of looks like a backbone with ribs. Uh, that's kind of where it comes from, a skeleton with vertebrae ribs or fish bones. Uh, that's an example of a variety. Um, we also, in addition to looking at the cloud type and naming clouds, we can also look at the amount of coverage that clouds are doing for the entire sky. And we have a few words that we use to describe cloud coverage. Um, and we'll refer to this as uh, you know, cloud coverage being in the celestial dome, which is dividing the entire uh, 360 degree view uh, around the azimuth um, up into quadrants. And so if zero out of the eight quadrants are covered, so there's essentially no clouds, we'll refer to that as SKC, which is sky clear. Uh, if one 
eighth to two eighths of the sky is covered by clouds. We'll refer to that as few. If four, three, excuse me, three eighths to four eighths of the cloud of the sky is covered by clouds, we'll refer to that as scattered. And if five eighths to seven eighths of the sky is covered by clouds, we'll refer to that as broken, B K N. And if all of the sky is covered, that'll be overcast, O V C. And that's eight out of eight quadrants. And the other thing about the cloud coverage is that it's cumulative starting at the surface and moving upward in the atmosphere. And that'll become more apparent when we start doing an example of this. And then the other thing about the cloud altitudes is that they're always identified in hundreds of feet above ground level and not above mean sea level. Um, because what's relevant for low, medium, and high clouds is where they are in relation to the, the ground. So here we're gonna introduce the celestial dome as a way to act, actually calculate the sky coverage. So what we have is a radial plot with zero at the origin and radial demarcations uh, every 2,000 feet. Uh, so we're looking at from zero to 2,000, 4,000, 6,000, 8,000, all the way up to 10,000 feet above uh, the ground level. And uh, the sky is divided up into eight quadrants, uh, each one representing one eighth of the entire sky. Um, so we have this two dimensional representation of a kind of a three dimensional view. Uh, <clears throat> and so what we have here is we have no clouds at the surface. We have no clouds at 2000 and the first cloud layer actually occurs at 4000 feet above ground level. And it happens to be covering up four eighths of the sky. That's four quadrants out of eight. So that means that an observer at the ground is looking up at the sky and exactly half of the sky is filled with clouds at this elevation. And four eighths uh, basically falls into the scattered category, SCT. And then we will describe the altitude of these clouds in hundreds of feet as 040. So SCT 040. If we look at the next cloud layer, we have another cloud deck at 6,000 feet. But uh, as the uh, celestial dome is essentially cumulative, we can't, it doesn't matter that part of that cloud deck extends over the deck at 4,000 feet because we wouldn't be able to see that from an observer at the ground anyway. But if you look from the observer at the ground, now, if you look all the way up to 6,000 feet, now you have five quadrants out of eight that are covered with clouds, and that falls into the broken category. And so we now refer to that as broken at 060, which is basically 6,000 feet above the surface. The next cloud layer is occurring at 8,000 feet, and it adds one more quadrant to the coverage. So we now have six eighths coverage uh, for the entire sky, and that's at 8,000 feet, so that's also going to fall into the broken category at 080. In this example, we also have a cloud deck at 10,000 feet, but from an observer's standpoint, those quadrants are already filled, and you wouldn't be able to see that cloud deck from the surface anyway, and so it doesn't add to our celestial dome coverage, so it doesn't uh, show up uh, explicitly uh, in our description of the different cloud layers in the celestial dome. If we look on the right, once again, in this case, we had no clouds at 2,000 feet, but we do have a cloud deck uh, starting at 4,000 feet, and it's covering up two out of the eight quadrants, and if it's, and that basically makes it fall into the category of few, and we would refer to this as few at 040, so that's at 4,000 feet elevation. And it doesn't matter that this cloud is deep. From an observer's standpoint, um, you can't see what's above the, the initial cloud deck anyway. Uh, and cumulative, uh, as you move up in the atmosphere, we're not adding in any additional quadrants. So this is really only just labeled as few at 040. We have two more examples. Uh, bottom left, the first cloud deck is identified at 4,000 feet elevation. Uh, that's one eighth coverage. One eighth coverage is few. So that's gonna be few at 040. 
The next cloud deck is at 6,000 feet, and it's going to cover up an additional one, two, three, four. So cumulatively from the surface up to 6,000, we now have coverage of five eighths coverage of the sky. That falls into the broken category. So that's going to be broken at 060. And then we have another cloud deck at 10,000 feet, and it is going to complete the uh, filling of the quadrants of the celestial dome. And so at that point, you have eight eighths coverage, which will be overcast. And it first became overcast at 10,000 feet. So we look at this, it's few 040, broken 060, and overcast 100. And lastly, uh, we have no uh, cloud deck at uh, 2,000, nothing at four. The first one's at 6,000. It covers one eighth coverage, and that's going to be few at 060. And then we don't have any additional clouds until we get to 10,000 feet. Uh, it covers up one additional quadrant. We're now at two eighths coverage, but that still falls into the category of few. So that's going to be few at 100 which is basically 10,000 because we're in hundreds of feet. Cloud sizes. This is a figure 6.10 from the Stull textbook. And it basically shows that the size or the, the width uh, of these clouds um, in the atmosphere are described by a log normal type distribution. Uh, as it turns out, the most common size of these clouds in the sky uh, cumulus clouds that we're referring to here is a little bit less than a kilometer, but you know, as you get bigger, uh, the the clouds become less common until you get up to you know clouds that are bigger than you know, two thousand or two point five kilometers. Um, they're still out there, but they're a relative rarity compared to the smaller clouds. And this is a relatively narrow range of cloud sizes, they don't vary hugely, and that allows you to uh, be able to visually identify the height of a cloud, of a cumulus type cloud, by seeing this, the apparent size of the tuft or the, uh, the convection. If it's bigger, then uh, the bigger the uh, convection appears to look, uh, then the, the lower it typically is in the atmosphere. And lastly, we're gonna talk about the different fog formation mechanisms. Uh, so if in a broad picture, you know, the only ways to create clouds or in this case fog at the ground is to either add water vapor to the atmosphere to make it saturated, to cool the atmosphere to make it saturated, or to mix two air parcels together uh, that were initially subsaturated but the due to the linear mixing rule, you can actually have um, them become a saturated sort of thing. And there are several different mechanisms by which we can do this. The first one happens to be what we call radiation fog. And no, we're not talking about nuclear disaster. We're just talking about on clear, calm, dry nights, the uh, atmosphere will lose a lot of radiation to space uh, through the emission of infrared heat energy. And as the atmosphere is emitting this radiation to space, it will be cooling and it will continue to cool all night long. Um, this, uh, if there's any topography involved, that cold air will drain down into the bottom. We see that here in Salt Lake uh, all the time. Cold air drains out of the valleys at night or out of the mountain valleys at night and into the, uh, the Salt Lake Valley. And if you cool the air enough, and you cool it down to the dew point, uh, then fog will form. And this type of fog is usually very shallow, um, only a couple of hundred feet deep. And that fog will persist uh, until the sun comes up and starts to uh, evaporate it. The favorable conditions for radiation fog are long nights, a dry troposphere above the boundary layer, you know, if you had a dry boundary layer, this wouldn't be good because it would be very hard to cool it all the way down to the dew point. So you do need moisture in the boundary layer. And then you need light winds to prevent uh, the mixing 
because mixing will eliminate a, any temperature inversion that starts to form at ground level. Another type of fog formation is a valley fog formation. And in this case, uh, you know, in the West during the winter, this radiation fog can build up day after day because the sun isn't strong enough to evaporate the fog. Uh, and it's not strong enough to uh, warm the ground uh, so appreciably. And so the fog that formed one night will persist all through the next day. And as that happens, more cold air will drain down into the system uh, and will cause eventually this uh, radiation inversion to get deeper and deeper. Uh, and um, we refer to this as essentially valley fog. So the only difference here between the radiation fog and the valley fog is the fact that we have basin topography, which will trap the cold air. And uh, if you have a weak sun, then it may not be able to burn off and it can persist for many days. We have upslope fog formation. Uh, so in this example, you have air that is moving over topography that is uh, increasing in height. Uh, so, here along the Wasatch, if we had air that was moving towards the Wasatch Mountains and it can't go around it, it's going to have to go over it. And as it flows upslope, uh, it may in fact uh, reach its uh, dew point temperature or its lifting condensation level and you have a cloud that forms that's in contact with the ground. Uh, this is very common in Kansas and Colorado where you have a gentle slope. Uh, that goes from Kansas up to um, Colorado and the Rocky Mountains. And if you have air that flows from the east to the west, you'll have air that flows upslope, and that can create fog. Um, and so the favorable conditions for upslope fog formation are sustained upslope flow and a moist boundary layer. We can also have what we refer to as steam fog. If you have cold air that is blowing over much warmer water, uh, the water will be evaporating into the cold air, but the air is cooling it uh, quite rapidly. And so uh, the evaporation is raising the dew point, but the uh, cold air uh, has a low um, saturation water vapor pressure. And uh, you can actually cool the air to its dew point right readily. Uh, the favorable conditions for steam fog are a warm surface water with cold air above and light winds uh, so that you don't have a lot of mixing. This is really common over mountain lakes uh, during the fall when you have cold air that moves over them. They look like they're steaming. It can also happen out over the ocean as well when you have cold air that moves over uh, warm water. We can also have precipitation fog. And precipitation fog is just occurring because we have rain that is falling into the air and evaporating and raising the relative humidity. Uh, and this added vapor increases the dew point and eventually can cause the air to become completely saturated uh, in the boundary layer, at which point fog can form uh, without much of a temperature uh, difference at all. Uh, the favored conditions for this are sustained precipitation, which leads to a very moist boundary layer. Uh, we can also have what we refer to as advection fog, where we are bringing warm, moist air over a colder surface. Uh, that cold surface will cool the air at constant pressure until the uh, dew point is reached, at which point fog will form. The two most common scenarios for this to happen is you have warm, moist air that moves over a cold ocean, or you have warm, moist air that moves over a snow-covered surface. Either one uh, will have the same impact. And we refer to this as advection fog because the um, temperature and moisture advection uh, are occurring in order for this fog to form.